So um, welcome to this late afternoon session here where we're going to discuss the new Navitor valve and FlexNav delivery system. So we have some learning objectives here. First of all, we're going to see uh, the design of these, this valve and this uh, delivery system. Also talk about the data, the evidence we got from it. We're going to see a demonstration, demonstration here, a live case. And then we're going to talk about how this valve will fit into the future, particularly when we're going to treat patients uh, with a longer life expectancy. My name is Lars Sondergaard. I'm here with Mauritius Taramasso from Zurich in Switzerland, Dave Smith from Swansea in the UK, Francesco Bodoni from Milan in Italy, and Leonard Conradi from Hamburg in, in um, Germany. So, um, Mauricio, we also want this session to be as interactive as possible. Yes, exactly. Thanks, Lars, for uh, reminding this. Uh, I would like, since this is a kind of hybrid meeting, I would like to encourage all the participants from the, the studio, but also from home, connectly, remotely, to, to post your question in the, in the chat. We have a chat master who is uh, Dr. Giulia Masiero from Italy will address uh, most of your questions, and we will pick up also some from the most interesting one to guide our discussion later on. So please, uh, let's keep the session interactive. And uh, I think we can now, before starting with the first presentation, quickly launch one uh, pool for you to stimulate discussion in the chat, since uh, one of the learning objectives of this session is uh, life management of patients with TAVI. If we can show the, the pool question in, in the screen, otherwise I can read it for you. It's just, uh, uh, by treating a patient with concomitant coronary artery disease uh, uh, in the view of a future possible intervention in the coronary, which factor would you focus on the most in selecting the valve? First one is stand design, for example, the dimension of the cell or the profile of the valve. Then the valve design, so the leaflet position intraannular versus supraannular, or the procedural technique, so how to achieve procedural alignment. We will, we will see your answer at the end of the session. I think we can start now. The first uh, uh, topic is an overview of the Navitor with the FlexNav TAVI system, and also an overview of the 30 days outcome from Dave Smith. Thank you, Maurizio. So I'm going to introduce you to the Navitor FlexNav system. So that's the, my conflicts of interest relative to this presentation. So every valve system also starts with its delivery system and the FlexNav delivery system has been published and previously talked about, but in summary, it's a very flexible and highly deliverable system, which consists of an inline hydrophilically coated sheath system that's able to be delivered to very low profile femoral arteries of 5.0 millimeters for the smaller valves and 5.5 millimeters for the larger valves. It's therefore able to deliver very stable and accurate deployment of valves and also maintains the portico advantage of being recapturable, repositionable, and even if needed, retrievable. But we've come here to talk about the valve itself, the Navator valve, which is a next generation valve from Abbott. There are a number of design features that have been changed, starting from the top down to the bottom, the curved aortic cells, minimizing the likelihood of damage to the aorta and also uh, release from the delivery system itself. We've kept the large cell design for coronary access, and there's been optimized radial force, but perhaps most interestingly of all, there's now this outer navaseal cuff designed to minimize paravalvar leakage. And just to talk about the Navaseal cuff in more detail, it's an active cuff system that fills in diastole to try to mitigate paravalvar leakage, molding the, to the surrounding anatomy, and ultimately recruiting tissue ingrowth for a permanent seal. And as shown by this model of an inflow valve view of the Navator system, you can see that the highly conformable nature of the cell design of the system, the frame, together now with this active paravalvar leak mechanism, the Navaseal cuff working in diastole, provides the theory for reduced paravalvar leak that I'll show later. 
So Lars presented this data at Euro PCR, and I will just summarize it for the benefits of this presentation. So essentially, this was a first in-man study in 19 sites throughout Europe, Australia, and the United States. I'm going to show you, as Lars did, the 30-day data, but the follow-up will be out to five years. The primary endpoints of the study consisted of all-cause mortality, as well as the instance of moderate or greater paravalva leak at 30 days. There are also a number of secondary descriptive endpoints as listed in the bullet points there. So to show you the demographics of this high stroke extreme risk group of patients, a mean age of 83 and a half years, valve parameters that were consistent with severe aortic stenosis, and over 80% of patients had at least one frailty factor. In terms of the procedural outcomes, every patient got a valve. There were no deaths, no conversions to surgical aortic valve replacement, but there were three patients that required an additional valve in valve, either due to malposition of the first device or movement upon post dilatation, with clinician's discretion being allowed to perform a valve in valve procedure. In terms of the outcome safety data at 30 days, there were again no deaths and very low rates of clinical events. So we had one stroke, one major vascular complication, and three life-threatening bleeds in a high-risk population. There was a 15% rate of new pacemaker implantation, but of these 16 patients, 13 of them already had pre-existing conduction abnormalities, potentially in keeping with their high-risk status. And this is probably the standout slide of that I will present to you. So on the left, you see valve hemodynamics with low mean gradients, single digit mean gradients, reducing further from discharge to 30 days, and high effective orifice areas being maintained from discharge to 30 days. And very strikingly, on the bar charts on the right, no patient had moderate or severe paravalva leak and 80% of patients had no paravalva leak, and this was core valve adjudicated. In keeping with this great hemodynamic performance, we also had uh, functional improvements, so 97% of patients were either in MYHA class one or two at 30 days, and 85% of the patients had an improvement in at least one NYHA class from baseline, and that was also uh, added to with symptomatic distance improvement on average of 21 meters between baseline and discharge in their six minute walk test. So I will stop there and we will then carry on. Thank you, Dave, um, for this uh, overview. So we have seen most uh, next generation valves have adding this external ceiling skirt. Uh, I think the data we've been seeing now for the Navitor is probably the best we've ever seen. Uh, no patient with more than a mild PVL and 80% of the patient with none are, are just a, a trivial. It, what, what makes the difference in dif different types of these uh, ceiling skirts? Uh, yeah, it's an excellent question, isn't it? Obviously, we're dealing with a synthetic ceiling cuff here. And as we've seen from this data, this is, I think, as you say, class leading data mm. in terms of reduction of paravalva leaks. So this active diastolic filling of the Navaseal cuff certainly seems to be a very effective design at reducing paravalva leak, both on the table and maintained at 30 days. Mm. So, so Mauricio, do you think it does it have a, an, an impact for the long-term long outcome for the patient if they have a mild PVL or is, is it as good as it needs to be? Or? Uh, I think it's highly depending on which patient we are, we are, we are talking about. Mm. Uh, probably in a high risk and uh, elderly population, mm. mild paravalvular leak has not an impact, mm. especially if you have already some coexistent aortic regurgitation. Mm. Whether this has an impact in younger population with no associated aortic regurgitation, actually, we don't know. I think if we can reduce it the most, it's absolutely better. And I think the, the, the direction and the promises of this valve is exactly in that direction. So if we talk about ma lifelong management of a patient, uh, I think it's better to have, I, I think we should try to abolish even this mild, and, uh, uh, but it's highly depending on which kind of patient we are treating, I think. Yeah. 
So maybe I can ask you, Leonard, as, uh, are these data um, acceptable when you compare to surgical valves? I would say so, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so um, I was also struck when I saw these data. I was uh, <clears throat> positively surprised. And, um, you know, apart from maybe two issues, which is uh, pacemaker uh, rates and uh, durability, there are no, no question marks or no differences compared to surgical aortic valve replacement. Now, whether the pacemaker rates, as is suggestive here in this data set, is just, you know, um, a sign that is being sent by that high-risk population and may decrease as we're moving into lower-risk patient population, that seems likely, but it's not proven yet. Mm -hmm. And in terms of durability, obviously, we'll have to wait for longer-term data. But yeah. in summary, yes, I would say this is very surgical-like kind of mm -hmm. acute data outcomes, at least. Yeah. But, but let's, we, we can continue talking about durability, and maybe you, Francesco, we have seen one of the most important factors uh, which is going to impact the durability is that you avoid patient prestige mismatch. Yeah. Uh, how is this valve, you know, this is still a self-expanding technology, but it got an intra leaflet position. Does that make it different compared to if you have a super leaflet position? I will talk about this uh, topic uh, in my mm, uh, presentation, but uh, just uh, it's a um, Navitor valve is a very light structure and the uh, uh, the, the result uh, in terms of uh, valve area and uh, gradient is very, very good. It's absolutely comparable with the supraannual valve. We know that probably supraannual valve, large valve area has a great impact on, uh, on uh, long-term durability. We know, for, we learned from surgery that uh, small area and uh, presence of uh, patient prothesis mismatch has an impact in durability, valve deterioration, and mortality too. So to uh, have a valve that can uh, have the, the, the same uh, uh, valve area than a uh, supraannual valve is very interesting, uh, despite the fact it's an intraannual valve. There's also a design feature with the Navitor valve, which is different from the, from the core valve. So you know that the inflow part is cylindric, and also the leaflet is actually working in a cylindric uh, fashion when they open up, whereas for the core valve platform, the evolute platform, it's a tapered. So also the leaflet are tapered, and I think that can partly explain why you get the same hemodynamics uh, with an inside position leaflet as compared to a supranal leaflet position. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is absolutely one of the reasons that uh, probably we have uh, a so good uh, hemodynamics in this kind of patient. And probably this, uh, this straight uh, shape of the portico has an impact even in terms of the pacemaker rate. Mm. So Dave, uh, we have seen now uh, this uh, excellent outcome with the Navitor valve. There is one gap still with the Navitor valve. That's patient with a large anatomy. Is that going to be solved in the, in the future? What do you see? Yeah, very good question, isn't it? I think uh, already in trial study are the, is the Titan larger valve, which I think will be a very welcome addition to the Navitor family. It will allow us to treat uh, diameters of annually up to 30 millimeters. And certainly in my practice, that will uh, fill the most common reason why I cannot currently use a Navitor in my practice. So as soon as we have the data, I'm sure that we will be then discussing the results of the Titan valve, the larger Navitor size valve. Which will go up to about 30 millimeter annular size? Uh, absolutely. So increasing the range of options for treating patients with the Navitor family of valves. So Tamara, so going back to the delivery system, the FlexNav system, which or about a year ago uh, coming out. Um, it's, it seems to be a very low profile and very flexible system. What difference does it make in your clinical practice? Absolutely it is. I think it was really a major step forward. I mean, everybody think it's just a slight improvement in the delivery system, but actually change a lot, especially two aspects. One is actually the profile. At the moment, it is the smallest profile of the delivery system of commercial available valves being uh, compatible with a 14 French uh, for the smaller valve or 15 French for the 27 and 29. So it's really small and as you said, it's also really flexible. It's really flexible at 30, 360 degrees. So even in calcific and tortuous anatomy, you can accommodate uh, the, the, the tortuosity without manipulating as well as the stability of the implant. The stability layer which has been added in the shaft really makes the, the value in the deployment absolutely stable. I would say 
even more stable than other self-expandable device. I think it's absolutely precise. Once you start at the landing zone that you want, basically you, you, you don't need to, to adjust the position. It really stays, so it, it makes the procedure much easier and also easier to teach, I would say, for a for new implanter. So, so the stability layer, the purpose of that is to prevent its diving towards the yeah. LV during valve deployment. But there's also one other feature. I mean, you have internal lifted position, so, so you don't see the, the drop in blood pressure. You don't need to pace during a deployment, and you don't need to go fast during the middle part. So I think that all added up together will mean that you have a quite stable valve position during, during the deployment. Absolutely. I think this will be even more important for the Titan valve were probably, I mean, compared with other valves, where bigger valves are associated with a slightly longer uh, occlusive flow, I think this will, will make really a difference for the, for the bigger valve. I have yeah. not direct experience yet, but I expect uh, yeah. to have a patient fully stable, even with the tighter valve. So there's also, I mean, a discussion about um, the radial force. You were mentioning, uh, Dave, that it has been optimized here across all valve sizes. And I think personally, when we talk about radial force, there's some confusion what we actually mean. Uh, to me, uh, I think you can divide it into two things. Um, what I call expansion force or opening force, you have the valve crimped inside the delivery system. It has to overcome the resistance from the calcium. And then you have the radial force. What force does it actually apply when it's fully expanded to the aortic annulus? And actually for the nav Navitor valve, uh, the radial force is is the same as for the Evolut. It's actually higher than it is for the Evolut valve for all size, sizes. And it's more stable across the, the working range. Uh, it's not being less for, for the larger part of the working range. The opening force, on the other hand, is, is less. And I think that's giving you one feature. It's giving a more flexible system. On the other hand, you often need to compensate by doing more pre-dilatation if you have a severe calcification. How often do you need to pre-dilate? And you have a lot of experience with this valve, Dave. Yeah, so I, I pre-dilate the majority of my valves. I will probably pre-dilate about 90% of my Navitor valves, but I will equally post-dilate about 5% of them. So I think that a calcified valve needs preparation for valve implant in the way that a calcified coronary lesion needs preparation before implantation of a stent. So. I think knowing the attributes of your technology, but optimizing them, and in this case, preparing the valve for a valve implant, I think is important. But as I say, in my practice, I hardly post-dilate valves anymore, provided that I perform an adequate pre-dilatation. Yeah. And, and back to you, Leonard, I mean, uh, we also have some patients which have very, who have very challenging anatomy, such as, like, as a horizontal aorta. And we know some of these systems where you have a very stiff delivery system, it can be difficult to get coaxial alignment. How do you see this flexible system in, in that, those kind of, of uh, challenging anatomies? I think it will actually help us because for all those reasons that you've mentioned before, the placement has become um, or has, has allowed, or the, the technology has allowed us to place very, very exactly, right? So there is, as you said, there is no need to rush through any procedure because you have immediate valve function, you have no compromise in hemodynamics. So <clears throat> the times where, you know, high placement was trading off with potential distal migration, I think they're over with this system. And so you can um, focus much more on, on uh, preciseness. And uh, as you say, in horizontal aortas, with the flexible system, I think laying the valve in the exact position that you want has become a lot easier, especially, again, since you're in no rush because you don't ever see hemodynamic compromise. Mm. And then just one final question, uh, Francesco. Even though it's not uh, approved yet for patient uh, for a valve and valve procedure, any experience from your side using this valve for valve and valve procedures? Yes, we published uh, um, a series of patients with valve-in-valve uh, valve procedure with Portigo. I thought it's a very good uh, option anyway because uh, uh, the gradient, we find the gradients are not so high and uh, it's very easy to, to, uh, to achieve uh, the, 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 the coronary to the ostia with, uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, quite easy to perform uh, 
uh, to perform um, mm. uh, the, the chimney technique that uh, unfortunately very very often is necessary mm. even uh, in, in some vault. And uh, another uh, situation that we uh, we appreciate in the last period, it's very easy to perform cracking on the valve uh, with portico. So uh, we, with, we, we could, uh, we could uh, uh, solve the problem with very, very small valve with cracking that we, can, uh, we could do very easily with portico valves. Yeah. So, so when you say cracking, you mean that the patient have a, a small, failed small. surgical valve which you fracture with a high pressure balloon. Yeah, yeah. because if we have some high residual gradient yeah. that we need mm. to, to, have, uh, to, to ameliorate the situation because uh, even the, 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 the patient protein mismatch is, yeah. uh, is a problem. Maybe we have a quick question from the chat. Any experience in bicuspid valve? Right. Uh, bicuspid valve, yeah, we treat uh, bicuspid, uh, even bicuspid valve with portico. I, I think portico has a very good conformability for very elliptic situation. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, portico valve is, uh, is, uh, can conform very well with, uh, with the shape of the bicuspid valve. For example, even with our preferred um, valve uh, in, um, in elliptic canals to um, uh, even we have the good experience uh, uh, comparing uh, portico, the result of, of, uh, of a portico valve with uh, other, uh, for example, uh, the Evolut uh, valve and uh, the results are, uh, are better because uh, the, the perivalvular area is lower with portico because of, there is a better conformability mm -hmm. in a very elliptic situation. Okay, thank you, and I think we can move forward with the program. Uh, now we will uh, we look at a recorded case from, from Leonard, a uh, case with the transfemoral implantation of, uh, of the Navitor valve with the FlexNav system. Okay, thank you, for Maurizio, for introducing, and thanks for PCR to invite me to this session. The green one? Sorry, okay. these are my conflicts of interest. <clears throat> So the case I'll be presenting you today is a 72-year-old male patient, normal build. He's uh, highly symptomatic. His medical history reveals hypertension and uh, uh, diabetes, moderate renal failure. He is a former smoker with somewhat reduced pulmonary function. And even though he doesn't have um, significant uh, coronary artery disease at present, there are some intermediate lesions on all three vessels which might require uh, intervention further down the road, and remember, this is 70 years old, so not uh, very elderly. Uh, and his risk score is 2.7% as measured by Euroscore 2, and 2.1 as per STS PROM, so probably towards a intermediate range risk profile. This is his baseline echo. He has preserved LV function and right heart, right ventricular function. This is uh, a tricuspid aortic valve, which is severely stenosed, and there is some concomitant mild, maybe to moderate regurgitation, as you can see on the right lower hand panel. This is coming, uh, the CT planning. Uh, it's a mid-size annulus of uh, almost 25 millimeters, 24.7 by parameter estimation. The LVOT is a little, little tighter, but not much. And from these images, you can also appreciate that there is a certain amount of LVOT calcification, even though it's not the most terrible cases that we do treat. Uh, as for the valve itself, it's mild to maybe moderate valvular calcification present in this case. Coronary takeoff height is comfortable, so we're not expecting issues there in this um, uh, regular shaped aortic route. And um, the uh, predicted CR angulation gives us an LAO caudal for the coplanar view, but the cusp overlap view that many of us now use for implant is the typical RAO caudal, as you can see on the right side. There is a good and adequate iliofemoral anatomy, just some slight tortuosity, but otherwise uh, vessel diameter and course are normal. There's no heavy calcification on the excess vessels. And um, we'll go into the case. I think you'll have to start the movie remote. Thank you. So this is a case we recorded uh, some, some weeks ago. We typically go for a dual arterial puncture. The diagnostic picture typically is being inserted via the right radial. 
and this is the uh, root shot angiography, which we typically do in the typical three cusp and planters view before crossing the valve with a tumor wire. And as soon as that is established, what we do in these uh, local anesthesia only cases is measure invasive gradients by two pigtails, uh, just have uh, baseline, um, uh, baseline measures here. We uh, imp then the, the next step would be to insert the stiff working wire before we insert a 14 French sheath for predilatation, just like Dave Smith has told us. I also do tend to predilate most of these valves um, with you know, a, a slightly smaller balloon of maybe two to three millimeters smaller than the actual annular diameter. And this is the actual valve. Mm, we're using a 27 millimeter valve. So this is a 19, true 19 French outer diameter inline sheath which has a ni nice uh, nose cone for easy insertions, hydrophilically coated, as has been said, which makes for easy insertability. And the flexibility of the system in itself makes for very nice passage through even tortuous anatomies and certainly smooth crossing of the arch. Before we continue, we switch to the RAO caudal uh, three cusp overlap or, or cusp overlap view and then insert the valve into the annulus itself. Next step would be to start unsheathing. I make a point, and I guess most of us do, in going slowly. There's no need to rush it. This is a valve towards the lower end of radial force. And uh, since there is no hemodynamic compromise, there's also no need to rush it. And uh, we go slowly. Sometimes we do, as in this case, use fast pacing, around 120, maybe 140 beats, uh, just to um, increase stability. And then we unsheath very slowly, uh, and as has been said before, this is an extremely stable valve. Um, and until we reach the hard stop, which means the end of the first implant step, we'll just take, go on and then uh, stop with the fast pacing for a first angiographic assessment. I typically do it in the cusp overlap first. Sometimes I then turn to a perpendicularized um, um, angulation and do a second shot, not always, but at, in this time, at this time point. And if, I'm satis if we're satisfied with the positioning, uh, we'll just uh, activate uh, the safety button and then very slowly in a neutral push-pull kind of uh, uh, force distribution on the catheter, we'll just uh, go for final valve deployment. I think you can see just a slight waist towards the left corner circumference, so that makes uh, or, or ensures stable valve position. And uh, when you reach the end of the second deployment step, one crucial thing is to make sure that all three tabs are clearly visible. Uh, so that the catheter has detached from the actual valve. Mm -hmm. And the only thing left to do now is uh, retrieve the delivery um, and bring in, as we do, uh, the pigtail catheter once again into the left ventricle, recover the diagnostic root pigtail from the non-coronary sinus in order to repeat our transvalvular uh, gradient assessment, which you will see in, in just a minute. Um, and then after that has been recorded, of course, we'll need to follow up with a root shot angiography. I think here already you can see there's no more. The peak, peak gradient has been eliminated. There's good uh, diastolic pressure separation and a dichrotic notch, which is already suggestive of a good uh, result in terms of leakage as well as gradient. But naturally, we follow up with uh, angiography such as this one, which I think is a more than acceptable result with just trace paravalvular leakage. Um, in a nicely, nice and high positioned valve. And um, then you're pretty much at the end of the procedure with typically with in, in regular cases which are anatomically not as challenging, takes no more than 30 to 35 minutes maybe. And then vascular closure is achieved with uh, the closure system of your choice. Um, pressure bandage, this is uh, the final result in terms of hemodynamics. So a 70, uh, 70 millimeters mercury diastolic pressure and again, uh, hints at uh, a good hemodynamic outcome, and then patient can be transferred to uh, a holding area after going back to the regular ward after a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think we're at the end of the, of the case. This is uh, the patient's discharge echo, just to follow up. Discharge occurred on day five. Mean gradient was seven, and there was no maybe trace. I don't even know if you can see it here. Uh, certainly not hemodynamically relevant leakage, so a nice result in this case. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. That was a great demonstration, uh, Leonard. So, um, again, back to this question we had before about uh, bicuspid valves. Are, are there any anatomy where you would not use uh, the Navitor valve in your institution? Okay, so I have to admit that we have not treated bicuspids mm -hmm. as of yet. 
Um, we've uh, our experience with the Navator in around 40 cases, so it's not huge, but uh, it's, uh, so we'll, we'll tackle those a little later, I think. The most uh, um, prominent hurdle for Navator, I, I would agree, is large annuli. Uh, we, I work in the north of Germany. There are a lot of large people, and annuli exceeding 27 are not as infrequent. So that is one gap that could be filled. Um, otherwise, even a more pronounced uh, calcification on valves are uh, doable, I would say. And especially cases such as this with LVOT calcification, I agree that one of you said that the stent has nice conformability. And uh, I had that feeling with a previous version as, uh, already with Portico that it accommodates somehow around LVOT calcification and leads to nice results, whereas more stiffer valve inflow stent types with other manufacturers may leave you with focal leakage. Mm. There is some, some discussion ongoing on, on the chat about uh, how to achieve commissural alignment with, with Navitor. Can you comment on this or maybe Lars, you, you did a lot of... Uh, yeah, we, I can do it, but you, you can start, Francesco, because yeah. you also have experience with commercial yeah. alignment. And maybe we can just start to say why is commercial alignment uh, something we're talking about today? Oh, sure. Navitor, um, Navitor has the advantage that the, 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 uh, is an intranular design, as it a very large cell, so the coronary cells is very easy. But to, if uh, we thought, think about uh, future Tavi and Tavi, commissarial alignment will be very important because uh, uh, it might be. Uh, create uh, a, a, the possibility to, to perform uh, uh, coronary access even with uh, um, TAVI and TAVI. So uh, commissural alignment is maybe more important for a supraannular valve, but is useful uh, uh, even uh, with portico valve. Uh, it's impossible to perform commissural alignment uh, for a balloon expandable valve, for example, but for all uh, uh, kind of uh, self-expandable valve is doable. Yeah. Uh, probably I will show you that the, with the Portico is a little bit, uh, last uh, I wrote a paper about that, a little bit more difficult than uh, uh, accurate and uh, enabled, but uh, is uh, quite easy to turn a file and find uh, the, the correct uh, yeah. commissure alignment even with Portico. So, so commercial alignment is uh, something we are discussing quite a lot now. And the whole issue is about when we implant this valve, if you do not pay attention, it's go these valves are going to be rotated randomly in the annulus. And you can have a situation where the leaflet posts are right in front of the coronary arteries, which of course is going to make it more difficult or in some cases even impossible to access the coronary arteries. And in a patient, as you demonstrated, who got pre-existing coronary artery disease, we need to be able to access these coronaries in the future. And also, if you're going to move to patients with longer life expectancy, we, we cannot accept not to do this. So that's why you can choose a valve where it's easier to access the coronary arteries. A valve with large stent cells as a Navitor valve, it's easier to pass a catheter. And also where you have an internal leaflet position, you have less tissue in front of the coronary arteries. And then you can try to optimize your implantation. So you actually orientate the transcatheter heart valve the same way as the native aortic valve. Exactly the same as a surgeon will do if he uh, inserted or replaced it with a surgical biprosthetic aortic valve. There are two features which is important if that should be possible. First of all, it needs to be easy to recognize where are the leaflet posts on the stent frame. And for, as you said, for you can see them on the Navitor valve in the mid stent frame. You can see those three leaflet posts, uh, but it's not the easiest one to see. You have to look a little bit careful, but if you do that, you can do it. And the second thing is, when you have identified it, how to actually to talk your delivery system so you rotate it, so you have your leaflet post in the right position. We can discuss in a minute about this COSPO lab technique you used, uh, Leonard, in your case. But again, if you have this right left COSPO lab view, the only thing you need to do is to position one of these leaflet posts on the far right of your fluoro screen. That's going to give you commercial alignment and ensure uh, future access to the coronary arteries. And just one final comment about access to the coronary arteries. Remember, some of these valves will, will fail one day. And if you do a TAVI in TAVI, the leaflets from the first post are going to be pushed aside and jailed between the two stent frames. And if you have a super analytical position, 
that's going to create a tunnel of tissue from the left ventricular outflow tract through the sinus of a salva and into the ST junction. And for those cases, it will be difficult and most likely even impossible to do it. So for these cases, it will be more a, a favor to, or better to have an inside lethal position so you still can access, access uh, the coronary arteries. We were talking about the COSPO lab technique, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that, uh, Dave. Uh, what, what does the COSPO lab technique offer uh, a physician when he's uh, doing the, uh, the TAVI procedure compared to the traditional uh, tree cusp co plan of view? Maybe you can explain the difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think the left right cusp overlap, which is probably the commonest cusp overlap uh, mode, means that we can do two things. We can accurately assess the depth of implant into the left ventricular outflow tract. And when we're talking about future patient considerations, that's minimizing the risk of conducting disease or even worse, pacemaker implantation. It means that in a left right cusp overlap, the depth into the non-coronary cusp below that into the LVT can be accurately assessed. That's where the uh, left bundle emerges in the left ventricle, so we can accurately place our valves to minimize that. And as you've also said, then if we roll back to a coplanar view, we can accurately assess the depth of the valve and the left side below the left coronary uh, sinus. Equally, as you said as well, to facilitate commissural alignment, the left-right cusp overlap view when you place your stent post to the right of the screen to the right of your aorta also enables us to perform commissural alignment. And I thoroughly agree that, for me, commissural alignment is about getting the <coughs> best result from the first valve that you put in because that will drive the, your ability and also your success of future TAVI and TAVI procedures. Uh, I have a question from, from Leola regarding the case. Actually, obviously, optimizing the result uh, means also minimize the, the rate of complication. And uh, I've seen that in this specific case, you use the collagen plug-based closure device. There are now some, some randomized data, obviously, uh, with some limitation, but showing that suture-based device, uh, like the ProGlide or the new ProStyle, could be associated with... Uh, with less vascular complication. Obviously, we have a highly experienced operator, so you, let's say, you, you abolish the, the learning curve uh, effect that could, in fact, in, in a less experienced operator, have impacted this, this data. So can you comment a bit on, on closure device and your experience and your preference? Yeah. So I agree that uh, learning curve is a huge you know, driver for, for success, of course. And it's probably, my personal opinion would be it's not so much a question which technology you're using, suture-based versus plug-based, but that you're comfortable with it and that you really understand the mode of mechanism. I wouldn't go as far as to say that there are some patient anatomies that are you know, more suitable for the one or other. Um, for us, somehow that plug-based system that I showed has become routine. And uh, it has become so um, um, reliable that I, I um, never uh, angiographically visualize the vessel anymore, except if there is bleeding to it to externally or if there's, there's no pulse distal. So um, maybe we should move on to you, Francesco. You got a lot of experience with this platform. So you got a presentation to share some of your experience, how, how this valve is actually working in daily clinical practice. Thank you, Lars. Yeah, we, we already discussed uh, the, the, these two topics uh, that are, they are really important for a long uh, lifetime strategy, especially with uh, we, go, we are going to treat uh, younger patients. So hemodynamics is very important and the incidence of all um, patient practice mismatch and the coronary excess. So uh, I told you that's a very, very uh, important of these two topics and uh, uh, Navitor can face uh, this, uh, uh, well, this situation because of the light metallic structure, straight uh, shape and uh, enlarged stent cell. Uh, we learn uh, from a randomized uh, trial comparing uh, Tavra with the surgery that uh, a severe PPM uh, may lead to uh, higher mortality and uh, higher structural valve deterioration. 
and uh, we have seen by Dave that uh, the the hemodynamics of uh, Navitor 30 day hemodynamics are very good uh, with a low gradient, a very large uh, area. Uh, in fact, uh, the, 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 the area and gradient are absolutely similar to the supraannular design and uh, is, uh, is lower, the gradient are lo lower than the balloon expandable valve like sapin tree. And uh, the, the incidence, for this reason, the incidence of a severe and moderate patient prothesis mismatch is the same. Uh, it's no different uh, compared to Evolt Pro, but is better than uh, Sapien Tree. This is our experience. Uh, we compare all the cases where we can measure the valve area and uh, uh, the sale of uh, our patient, the old comers, and you will see that uh, the, our results are the same. Uh, low rate uh, in, um, of uh, PPM and um, severe and moderate, absolutely similar to Evolt Pro, so supra, supra design. And even if we go to the smaller uh, valve, uh, a smaller valve with the perimeter uh, uh, below 72 millimeters, the results are the same. So the hemodynamics is absolutely good and uh, absolutely compared with the supraanal valve. The worst situation we discussed before the valve in valve is a valve in valve uh, procedure because uh, the because of the very uh, small area. But uh, if uh, we we see that the, if the true ID is uh, more or uh, or a twenty than twenty one, the incidence of uh, patient prothesis mismatch or the high gradient uh, more than twenty millimeters mercury is very very low. Is only one patient. And uh, in uh, very small, obviously, in a smaller um, valve, uh, the, the gradient is less than 21. So it's a very, very small um, prosthesis. Uh, the incidence is, uh, is higher. But uh, now, with, uh, as I told you before, uh, we can solve this problem. This is a uh, mitra flow with a, a true ID of 70, 70 millimeters. You will do the high gradient, the post procedural. Cracking is very easy to perform, and from there we can solve this kind of, of problem. Coronary assess is the other important topic, uh, and, uh, the in, and the, we have seen that the intraannular design and the large stent cells uh, let's to have a very easy uh, coronary access. This is a typical case uh, where a uh, portico face all the problem of this patient. Uh, you'll see difficult, problematic uh, femoral access. Uh, there's only one femoral access for an extra-anatomic bypass, severe aortic stenosis, and uh, left main and LED stenosis uh, calcified. So we can, we, in this case, we decide to implant first the valve to stabilize the patient and then it was very easy to perform through the large stent cell to perform the PCI. <clears throat> uh, there is some situation where the large stent cell, uh, for, uh, this, uh, for example, in valve in valve is very important because uh, uh, it's uh, easy to rewire. This is an either mitra flow, very small, with where is, uh, is, ma is mandatory the chipping technique, and uh, it's very easy to rewind, uh, rewire the, the 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 good cell uh, to to perform the PCI, avoiding the crash uh, in, uh, in due to the the war, the, 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 the a, a oblique uh, situation. Uh, obviously, for uh, optimize. Uh, the, the coronary access, uh, even thinking to future taving taving, is uh, very important to achieve a, a correct uh, commissural alignment. Uh, this, in, we, we have to perform this uh, in uh, in cusp overview uh, technique. You will see, and we have to have uh, one post on the right side in the smaller, uh, in front of the smaller curve of the aorta, and so. And with this, uh, uh, we have the possibility to perform this is a high rate of the situation. And uh, around uh, 75, 80% of patients, we, we can perform a correct uh, commissural alignment, uh, even though with the portico valve. Thank you, Francesco. 
So, so we have been talking um, a lot about this lifetime management of patient with aortic stenosis because everyone is, uh, is uh, expecting that this is going to expand to patient with longer life expectancy. So, um, Leonard, what from the surgical literature is patient prestige mismatch an issue for the patient? I, th I think so, yes. Uh, you can, I guess you could debate whether it has such cl clinical impact in elderly patients, but certainly it does in mid-aged or younger patients. I, I do, not only in terms of you know, relief of symptoms, but also in terms of valve durability. Mm -hmm. So I think, as Maurizio has also said, we need to uh, try to achieve the optimal result, and I think this, this platform does enable us to combine the best of both worlds, I guess, the advantages of intraannular valve design, if you think about um, future landing zone for possible subsequent intervention, if you think about the coronary accessibility with the, the, the um, beneficial acute hemodynamic results with low gradients. So, so can we identify patient at risk for patient prestige mismatch when they come forward with their aortic stenosis? Oh, yes, I do. Who are the patients that we should be looking for? Okay, so it's obviously those that have small uh, anatomies, mm -hmm. smallish uh, annuli, um, maybe hypercontractile left ventricles. Um, so these are the ones, and uh, I think this valve appears to be good, well suitable to solve this issue or to address this uh, uh, target population. Yeah, and also, I mean, that we have seen that. Um, uh, if you do surgery, you can, you can avoid patient prestige mismatch if you do root enlargement, but it's not used very frequently in, in, in most sites. Uh. I agree completely. You know, um, it's true that whenever you ask surgeons what do you do about this issue, the term root enlargement comes up, but uh, the numbers speak a different language. If you identify these patients on your pre-procedural CT scan to, to take them for Tommy. I, I agree. I think that uh, in an ideal world, I would hope that we would not be undertaking surgical aortic valve replacement with very small valves. Mm. I think to, as I said earlier, to make sure that we get the right procedure, that the first sitting for the patient for their lifetime management is key. And certainly for me, implant or seeing patients who go for open surgery with valves that are smaller than 23 millimeters of mercury, I'm fearful that these patients are going to end up with patient prosthesis mismatch. Yes, we can fracture the bioprosthetic uh, ring of the surgical valve but that is not without its risk as well so for the first time procedure i think in people with small valves i would certainly be arguing that a tavi valve might be the better treatment for them as their first procedure mm. so we have the patient at risk for patient prestige mismatch your surgeons surgeon don't want to do a root enlargement and you take the patient for a tavi does it make a difference what kind of valve you put into the patient? Yeah, ab absolutely. As we know now from uh, the series that have been published, not all valves are able to be fractured. So um, there, it certainly depends on the type of valve that is used up front um, and whether we can enlarge them by fracturing the, the sewing ring. The, the basal ribbon at the base of the valve is dependent on the type of surgical prosthesis that's used. Not all valves can be fractured. Um, so again, the type of valve that goes in first time round is critical to the lifetime well-being of the patient. Yeah, and Maritza, we already trust about it. If, you, if the patient is going for TAVI, there's also different transcatheter heart valves. And what about patient prestige mismatch? And yeah, I, I think um, uh, especially in a small annuli or in patients with big body surface area, which by the way, quite often they have also challenging access to have a, a valve like Navitor, which has an excellent hemodynamic profile in small annuli together with an excellent delivery system profile for challenging access. I would say this is almost an ideal valve for, for this kind of iris population. Obviously, there are also other, other uh, uh, devices namely devices with supraannular uh, leaflet configuration, which are pretty much performing well in this kind of small annular anatomy. But as uh, Professor Bedoni showed us, the, 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 the hemodynamic of, of Navitor is comparable to the one of supraannular devices. So to make the, the long story short, yes, absolutely. The, the type of valve that we decide to implant in this uh, high risk subset of patient is, does it matter, yes. What about balloon expandable valves? in these small annually? I think balloon expandable valve 
uh, even if the data so far uh, showing uh, are showing no, no let's say major clinical difference at one year if you have patient prosthesis mismatch so namely if you if you use a balloon expandable valve which is intraannular but with a slightly higher gradient as compared to the the Navitor valve we don't see any big differences in terms of, of mortality at one year but but we know from surgical experience that in the in the long run this has an impact so probably if the alumnus is small we can discuss which is the cutoff i would say but uh, it's probably a better idea to go for self-expandable. I do not remember in our experience a 20 millimeter balloon expandable valve implant. If the annulus is so small, probably you, you need to go for another valve. I don't know which is your experience or your opinion, but uh, it's definitely not the best valve no. for patient prosthesis mismatch no. prevention. Yeah. And I think we saw that also in the, in the partner tree trial that have actually if you, if you use a balloon expandable valve, uh, you're actually going to have the same rate of, of severe patient prosthesis mismatch as for surgical yeah. valve. So, so you lose a little bit of this otherwise benefit of using a transcatheter yeah. heart valve in, in these patients. Yeah. So uh, just we have to come to close to the end of this session, Francesco. But we, one thing we maybe should just uh, discuss once again is the pacemaker rate. We saw that in, uh, in this uh, portico NG study, it was around 15% of the patient uh, who didn't have a pacemaker before, who ended up with a pacemaker. Is that contemporary data? I mean, you got a lot of experience with this valve. But I think um, that uh, with the um, uh, CASP overlap technique, uh, trying to to, to, to maintain a high position during the implant, I think you, we, we can reduce uh, the incidence, the pacemaker rate uh, um, around uh, 10 percent. Uh, our current uh, uh, pacemaker rate uh, is, uh, uh, is 9 percent. So I think this is, a, this is a situation that I think is uh, absolutely acceptable yeah. for a patient. So, um uh, Maurizio, uh, we, um, we're going to see more data on, uh, on the Navitor valve. There's ongoing trials. Maybe you can just update us on, on the trials. Uh, yes, there is an ongoing trial, which is the Vantage trial, which is a trial with an uh, enrolling patient with a low risk and intermediate risk, uh, suitable for a Navitor implantation. There is also a harm in the trial uh, evaluating valve in valve patient. Um, most of the patient will be transfemoral, but also other alternative access are, uh, are um, let's say, in enrollable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think to, to study uh, the outcome in low risk and intermediate risk will be really crucial to, to identify whether this specific valve mm -hmm. could apply, because actually we, we do not have data in low risk population with, with, with Navitor so far. So I think uh, uh, to explore the, the the outcome in, in this subset of patients will, will be really crucial, and the promises are, are really high because we can have access to easy access to the coronary artery, we can have good hemodynamic, we have good profile, so it seems really to be a, a good valve for low risk population. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I think uh, we are really looking forward to this data. The, the trial just started, so we, we will need to wait a bit. Mm -hmm. I don't remember which is the end of the trial, but I think five year follow up yeah. is the it's 10 year, ten follow, year, up. Ten year so, follow up. So and it's going to enroll quite a large number of patients, the advanced yeah. trial. Is it 1,400 patients? Uh, yeah. 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 And uh, US, Europe, and Australia. So it's a, a worldwide trial, it's really big and uh, really important. Yeah. So, Dave, just to finish off, where does Navitor fit into your TAVI program? Yeah, good question. Navitor for me is a workhorse valve. Um, I think as a result of the technological evolution of it, it's probably expanded its use even further now into people with more complex annular anatomy because of the risk of paravalvar leak reduction now. So for me, it remains a workhorse valve and it's the dominant valve in my cath lab. Mm. And you, Leonard? Yeah, it's, it's becoming that too because we were so pleasantly surprised with the advantages not only of Navitor but particularly with FlexNav too, because this was, for me, meant a world of a difference, making it uh, maybe a, a valve for an experienced 
person to become almost a training valve, like Maurizio has also said, because it's very easy to proctor this valve as well as to train younger physicians because it's such a smooth and easy implant. You know, mm -hmm. there's never any way to rush, and even if you get the first attempt wrong, there's nice repositionability capability. So uh, I could see that uh, even, and I, I could see that in our practice as well, it could uh, uh, capture a larger proportion of patients mm -hmm. from the overall. It is also the working horse in your institution, Francis. You know, yeah, uh, the portico valve was uh, the first uh, self uh, reshittable uh, self responding valve, I think, in, since uh, two, 2013. Then, with no improvement in the valve for a long time until uh, the acquisition by Abbott, uh, even after. Uh, two years after the acquisition, but with the flex nav, uh, with, the, with the Navitor, now we have really a very, very good valve. Uh, we, we use all kind of valve, but nav Navitor is uh, absolutely a device that will increase the use in our, in our cat lab. Uh, we are using portico around, uh, the, the portico with flex nav around 30% uh, of our cases. So, but the thing is, Navitor is an incredible uh, result in terms of paravalvular leak compared to portico, first generation of portico. And the flex nav gave us stab great stability. So really, really they did a good job, in my opinion. And maybe before moving to the conclusion, uh, if we can have a look to the result of the pool that we, we posted at the beginning of the session. Okay, I have the result here. Actually, most of the people, 50% of the people, thinks that the most important way to, to ensure easy coronary access is the procedural technique. So apparently to achieve Commissural alignment is really mandatory, and our audience thinks uh, which is more important than valve design and stand design, which is only the most important for a minority of the... So we should really go on with mm. this, uh, how to learn, how to pro reproduce uh, this technique, which is actually quite easy to do it, but you have to pay attention and you have to, to be willing to do it. So I think we can uh, conclude this session. We have seen that uh, the next generation uh, delivery system, the FlexNav system, is, is offering very easy and very accurate uh, delivery of, uh, of this uh, Navitor valve. And the new features with the ceiling, cuff, the Navi seal, the last stem design, and uh, it's also making it easy to have coronary access. So I think in many ways we have demonstrated that this valve, or discussed this valve, got a quite a large potential as we're going to move forward to patients with longer life expectancy, where of course, the demand uh, on the valve is going to be higher than it was uh, in the beginning of the TAVI program. Durability, coronary access, paravalvular leak, vascular complication needs to be ideal uh, for, for these valves. So I want to thank the panel for taking part of this, uh, for the, to the Hamburg team, for the, the recording case, and for you uh, attending this session. Have a nice evening and see you again tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>